Beer proudly stands as the most consumed alcoholic beverage worldwide. If you think we drink a lot of beer in the United States, where we drink roughly 72.7 liters, or just short of 20 gallons per adult per year, realize that it only places this number 20 on the list of rankings of countries by per capita beer consumption, well behind the world leader Czech Republic, where they drink some 188 liters, or just short of 50 gallons of beer per adult per year. Worldwide production of beer is around 1.2 billion hectoliters annually, and in the United States alone in 2020, beer sales represented $22 billion. And about a quarter of that in America is craft beers. That's just kind of beers that add flavorings like fruit or coffee or pumpkin spice. There's some 8,200 craft breweries in the United States alone, but a law instituted in Bavaria some 500 years ago was intended to prevent exactly that adulteration of brew, and it still impacts the industry today. The Bavarian Reinheitsgebot, or laws regulating the brewing of beer, deserve to be remembered. Times in history, beer was safer to drink than water because the production process includes boiling. Boiling eliminates parasites, viruses, and bacteria that can cause illness. There's proof that beer has been brewed for at least 6,000 years, most likely originating in Mesopotamia, but perhaps beginning with the Sumerians. Hard evidence comes from written proof of a recipe for beer that also happens to be a poem honoring the Sumerian goddess of brewing. The poem describes beer made from bread made with barley. Iranian pottery that is approximately 7,000 years old also bears evidence of brewed beer. Archaeologists also believe they found an ancient brewery in China dating back 5,000 years, which contained the vats, ovens, funnels, containers, and chemical evidence of grains and beer byproducts. The Babylonian Empire built upon the Sumerian culture, inheriting their beer brewing ways, and brewed 20 different beers. Their king Hammurabi had beer regulations in the Codex Hammurabi, written circa 1750 BC, which is considered to be the most complete, longest legislative text of the ancient Near East. According to the Codex, workers received two liters of beer per day, officials got three, and managers and high priests earned five per day. In ancient Egypt, beer was made from rich yeasty bread that was lightly baked, crumbled, mixed with water and dates, strained, fermented in vats, and stored in large jugs. Workers were often paid in beer, and for those living and working at Giza, it was included in their daily rations. Beer was a staple not only for the Egyptian diet, but also in offerings to the gods. One Egyptian inscription from around 2200 BC reads, The mouth of a perfectly contented man is filled with beer. The oldest evidence of beer brewing in Germany comes from northern Bavaria, where a 3,000-year-old burial crock was discovered in 1935. The well-to-do tribesmen had been buried with provisions for his afterlife, and remnants of bread with the mash remained in a crock after three millennia. However, ancient Europeans were illiterate, so what we know of them came from the writings of their literate invaders from the south. When the Romans began to venture further north into Europe, they ran into the Germanic tribes of forest-dwelling, beer-brewing barbarians. Although Sophocles wrote in 450 BC that the best diet for Greeks included bread, meat, vegetables, and beer in moderation, the Greeks and Romans, with their fermented grapes, notoriously looked down upon beer drinkers. Greek historian, military leader, and author Xenophon wrote, There were stores within of barley, wheat, vegetable, and wine made from barley in great big bowls. The grains of barley malt lay floating in the beverage up to the lip of the vessel. The beverage, without admixture of water, was very strong. It's a taste you must acquire. Roman author Pliny wrote a few centuries later that the populace of Western Europe have a liquid with which they intoxicate themselves, made from grain and water. The manner of making this is somewhat different in Gaul, Spain, and other countries, and it is called by different names, but its nature and properties are everywhere the same. The people in Spain in particular brew this liquid so well that it will keep a good long time. So exquisite is the cunning of mankind in gratifying their vices and appetites that they have invented a method to make water itself produce intoxication. Despite their initial disdain, the Romans accepted beer, or at least improved it. In 1978, a complete Roman brewery was discovered in Bavaria. This evidence of the first modern brewing process, with the facilities required for malting, mashing, and wort boiling. As the Roman Empire waned, the European tribes continued with their traditions, with the women making the bread, the stew, and the brew. While beer brewing in antiquity consisted of combining ingredients and relying on wild yeast to eventually ferment the concoction, the modern beer brewing technique is quite involved. First grains or malt are milled to break up the kernels, creating a product called grist. 
The grist is then mixed with water in large tanks for mash conversion, a process in which the enzymes in the malt break down the starches into sugars. This mash is then pumped into another tank where the liquid, which is now called wort, is separated from the grain husks. The wort is boiled and hops are added. After this boil, the hops and any remaining grains are once again separated from the liquid. It is then cooled and yeast is added. The yeast ferments the liquid, creating alcohol and carbon dioxide. This new beer, called green beer, is pumped into yet another tank for maturation. And finally, after being deemed ready by the brewer, the beer is filtered, carbonated, and cellared for a further three to four weeks before bottling. When Christianity spread, monasteries were established all over Europe. The monks often fasted, but did not consider liquids, including beer, to break the fast. Their beers were nourishing, and the Christian trade of taking in travelers meant they shared their meager food supplies and their more ample beer supplies with travelers forming the first taverns. But these trends had an economic impact. In 1487, a law was passed in the Duchy of Munich that was then formalized after the 1503 reunification of Bavaria by Wilhelm IV, Duke of Bavaria, who was co-regent with his younger brother, Louis X. On April 23, 1516, Wilhelm introduced a series of decrees that in translation run just over 300 words total, mostly concerned restrictions on prices, stating what could be charged during different seasons. The Duke also reserved the right to change the law during grain shortages. But in the third provision of four total, there is a limit on the ingredients of beer. It reads, We wish to emphasize that in future, in all cities, markets, and in the country, the only ingredients used for the brewing of beer must be barley, hops, and water. Whosoever knowingly disregards or transgresses upon this ordinance shall be punished by the court authorities, confiscating such barrels of beer without fail. The purpose of this decree was not explicitly stated. One historian, Marine Ogle, author of Ambitious Brew, The Story of American Beer, believes that it was perhaps made to keep grains for bread safe from the insatiable beer brewers. Wheat and rye are more easily digested than barley, and so by preserving those grains for bread making, the price of bread was not driven higher by competition from beer brewers. Food scarcity, famine, and subsequent riots were a real threat in the 16th century Europe. Others believed it was a food safety regulation. In 2016, the BBC noted that according to the German Brewers Association, one of the goals of the purity laws was to stop unscrupulous brewers from adding dubious toxic and even hallucinogenic ingredients as preservatives or flavorings. They included herbs and spices such as rosemary, caraway, henbane, thorn apple, wood shavings, roots, soot, or even pitch. Brewers today quickly notice that yeast, arguably the most important addition to the whole process, is not included in the list of acceptable ingredients. Many believe this to be because they didn't understand yeast at the time. However, in the Middle Ages, there was a profession known as the Hefner, Hefe meaning yeast. After fermentation, there's a layer called Zoig, literally stuff, at the bottom of the tank. The Hefner would harvest this, press out the remaining beer, and add a small amount of the Zoig to the next batch. So yeast goes in, and more yeast comes out. Furthermore, in modern implementations of the decree, any item that is added to the beer and is subsequently removed is not a true ingredient, as it does not remain in the final product, therefore keeping in line with the decree. Also important to note is that these restrictions on ingredients only affected Bavarian lagers, in which the yeast is fermented at cool temperatures. To the north, ales were brewed using a variety of ingredients up to and including tree bark, fruit, and spices. And so for centuries, Bavaria had this rule regarding their beer, while the rest of the world went about brewing with wheat or whatever grains they had, using clarifying agents or flavorful additions. And the Bavarians seemed to like it that way. A January 2014 edition of the New Yorker quotes an American consul named George C. Tanner, who was stationed in Chemnitz, Germany in 1886. Beer is the national beverage and is used as such, if not to a greater extent than water, then assuredly equally so. Bavaria insisted that the laws be applied throughout Germany as a precondition for German unification in 1871. First, the empire merely taxed the use of other ingredients, mostly used in the north, but in 1906 the law was applied across all of Germany. But the law, called the Act to Amend the Beer Brewing Tax Act, set different rules for top-fermented and bottom-fermented beers. The website of the Loudon Brewing Company of Leesburg, Virginia explains, Have you ever had a Hefeweizen? How about a Rogan beer, a Gos, a Dunkelweizen? These traditional German beers include ingredients that are forbidden by the original purity law, namely wheat and rye. They also happen to be ales and not lagers, and the original law was intended for bottom-fermented beers only. 
According to a 2016 blog post on the webpage of the Library of Congress, the purity law was tested in 1893 in a legal case over spoiled beer. In the case, a brewer accidentally dropped a cat into the mash tun, which was killed and almost completely dissolved. Initially, the Bavarian Higher Regional Court acquitted the brewer after hearing from an expert witness who claimed that the boiling of animals such as rats and mice was commonplace and unavoidable. But fortunately, and I think we can all agree rightly, that court's decision was overturned by a higher court, the Imperial Court of Justice, which noted that the regional court's decision could be interpreted to suggest that animals are a usual ingredient in beer. In 1919, as a precondition for joining the Weimar Republic, Bavaria insisted on a guarantee that national beer purity laws would not supersede Bavaria's stricter laws. The act by which the Free State of Bavaria and Baden joined the beer tax community of the Weimar Republic in 1919 was the first version of the regulations to officially use the term Reinheitsgebot, purity law, to describe the law. The Reinheitsgebot allowed for leniency for ales while maintaining the restrictions on lager. The law raised new issues when Germany became a member of the European Union in 1958. The Loudoun website explains, when Germany adopted the Reinheitsgebot into their tax law, it created a precedent that beer could not be labeled as beer unless it adhered to the purity law guidelines. Germany began to reject imported products labeled as beer if they violated the German definition of beer and therefore sales of these imports was prohibited. During the formation of the European Union, this was seen as a violation of trade agreements. In 1984, the European Court of Justice ruled that the restrictions on foreign beers that did not conform to the Reinheitsgebot was a violation of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Germany was forced to accept imports of non-Reinheitsgebot conforming beers by European courts. But the decision seemed only to reinforce their belief that their pure beers were superior. Bavarian brewers tend to brag that their beer is still brewed according to the Reinheitsgebot. The Bavarian Brewers Association has registered the trademark Bavarian beer. But the Reinheitsbegot has faced challenges over time. Critics complain that it doesn't really protect the consumers in the ways that it claims. 1993 additions to the law allowed for some industrial chemicals that were part of the brewing process. For example, polyvinyl polyprilidone, or PVPP, to be included in the beer even under the law so long as it remained only in technically unavoidable amounts. And after German reunification in 1990, a prolonged legal battle that became known as the Brandenburg Beer War resulted in a court decision that gave an exception to a bottom-brewed beer that was brewed in former East Germany that allowed it to be called beer despite being sweetened with a pinch of sugared syrup. And the rules have not prevented industrial brewers from producing what Spiegel International calls interchangeable beers that the consumer can no longer distinguish on the basis of taste, but merely on the basis of TV advertising images. But a spokesman for the Bavarian Brewers Association notes that the laws still allow experimentation and great beer. In a 2016 article in The Guardian, the spokesman said, Anyone who believes that the Reinheitsgebot serves to limit creativity and gives rise to monotonous beers merely has to look to the immense diversity of the country's beer, which is the envy of the world. Today, the Reinheitsgebot is facing challenges even inside Bavaria, where brewers are looking for more flexibility in order to adjust to more modern tastes. But the more than 500-year-old tradition still has its advocates, as the New Yorker magazine explains. The Reinheitsgebot still occupies an almost mythic space in the German brewing industry's collective psyche, where many brewers see it as an emblem of high-quality traditional beer. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.